Hey, good evening, South Maine and all our friends. So good to be back with you again. Um, don't know if you've ever heard this story, but I, I wanted to share it with you. A friend told me about a story of a, of a college football coach at a small uh, college that was doing a great job, and his team was winning some games, and he was out on the practice field one day, and they were working hard, you know, getting all the drills in, working the team, everything was going well. One of the assistants came out to the field and said, coach, you've got a phone call. Well, typically the coach's answer was, you know, hey, I don't, I don't do phone calls while we're in practice. So he, he said, no, I, you know, I'm in practice. He said, coach, it's Sports Illustrated. You have a phone call from Sports Illustrated. His eyes lit up. His heart began to increase. He said, oh, okay, uh, uh, take over for me. I, I better take that. And as he was walking towards the phone quickly, he was just thinking of all the exciting things that might be happening. They finally see that we're a winning team. Uh, we're going to get some good interviews here. Maybe they'll do a video segment. Maybe they'll do an, an article on us or something of that nature. And he finally uh, gets to the phone. You know, he's trying to calm down. He's trying to breathe. So he takes the phone. Hello? Yes, Coach Davis? Yes, this is Coach Davis. This is Sports Illustrated. Your subscription is running out. Have you ever been humbled? I've been humbled before. You know, there are two ways that we can be humbled. One is that we can choose to humble ourselves. We can have and maintain an attitude like Jesus of always looking for the needs of others, of putting others first and before us, or we can be humbled by God or by someone else. We're going to be looking at James chapter 4 tonight. If you have your, your Bibles and you want to open those up, this is a beautiful passage. It's great, powerful life advice. And so I invite you to join with me as we read this together. Beginning in verse 6, it says, But he gives greater grace, therefore it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit therefore to God. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. I want you to think for just a moment, maybe use this as a, a little bit of a discussion time if you're with others. And ask each other, who is a person that you spiritually look up to? Maybe someone from your past, maybe a, a teacher, maybe a friend, maybe a mentor, an uncle, a neighbor, someone who really impacted your life spiritually. Who is that person and what are they like? Are they arrogant or would you describe them as humble? Discuss that for a moment or two. I know a, a list of names come up in my mind, people I look up to, and every one of the people that I look up to spiritually are humble people. Believe it or not, there are certain attitudes and activities that God hates. We say, well, yeah, but God is love. Yes, that's correct. And because he is love, there are certain things that God identifies as things that are completely the opposite of who he is and who we are called to be. In Proverbs chapter 6, back in the Old Testament, there is a passage that describes six or seven things that God hates. It says there are six things which the Lord hates, seven which are an abomination. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among brothers. It's quite a list, isn't it? Did you catch the first one? The very first thing that Scripture identifies that God deplores is pride, haughtiness, arrogance. The mindset that I'm just a little bit better 
than everybody else, a little smarter, a little more on the ball, that my opinion is the opinion that counts most. Jesus spoke and lived out the truth of humility throughout his entire life. And if you track with Jesus through the Gospels, you're going to see humility in everything he does and everything he says. And this week, if you're reading the Gospels, look for the attitude of humility in Jesus. You'll see it without a doubt. In Luke chapter 14, if you have your Bible still open, turn over to Luke 14 and take a glance at that. In the middle of Luke 14, Jesus has healed a man from a terrible condition, and then he's invited to a, a, um, a dinner party. And he's watching how the guests are trying to seat themselves and take the places of honor. In ancient meals, there were places of honor for the, the most highly respected guests, and then there were places for just common folk and others. And the guests were sort of playing musical chairs here, jockeying for position at this, this dinner party. And Jesus is watching this, I'm sure, just sick to his stomach. And this is what he says in verse 8. When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you may, may have been invited by him. And he who invited you both shall come and say to you, Give place to this man, and then disgrace you, proceed to occupy to the last place. But when you're invited, go and recline at the last place, so that when the one who has invited you comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will have honor in the sight of all who are at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself shall be humbled, and he who humbles himself shall be exalted. John Cross, in his book, Stranger on the Road to Emmaus, has this beautiful paragraph. I'm going to read that to you. It says, the behavior of the banquet guest in this parable seems to show that a good seat at the table didn't just reflect social standing, but might actually create it for them. For example, if you snagged a seat next to someone very important, you were guaranteed several hours of that person's attention. You could sell yourself or your ideas without interruption, and you could be seen doing so by others. We see the same today in politics, in business, and in circles of high society. This jockeying for position, this rubbing elbows with just the right people. Why? So I can elevate myself. And then others will think more highly of me, right? Wrong. How sad. And in Luke 14, if you continue to track with that chapter, Jesus takes it even another step more deeper in our attitudes. He says, when you have an event, when you have a dinner, when you have a gathering, invite those who are totally unexpected of being invited. He says to invite those who are uh, lame, the poor, the crippled, the blind. And here's the promise. He says, and you will be blessed since they do not have the means to repay you for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. I got to tell you, I think God's a pretty good boss. I think he's going to pay you well if he says he's going to take care of you. So have you ever been humbled? Oh, I've been humbled. Anyone who's been to grad school has been humbled by people who are incredibly intelligent. Maybe you played sports and been humbled. I remember one time, uh, first time I got to scrimmage with a college uh, workout, I put up my very best jump shot, squared up, got up, up off of the floor well, extended out, took a shot. You know what happened? It got knocked to the bleachers. 
That had never happened before. Talk about humbling. As I mentioned before, the life of Christ from beginning to end shows humility. Number one, you notice even as a boy, he honors his parents. When his mom sort of gets on to him for getting away from them as a young man, he honors her. He doesn't speak harshly to her. Number two, he speaks to people who are outcast and to the marginalized. He doesn't just speak to the powerful or the well-connected or, or those who have great political positions. No, we see Jesus interacting with all kinds of people, the poor, those who are lonely, the woman at the well, and others. And we think, well, Jesus, couldn't you be talking to crowds? But that person matters to God. Number three, he allows people to recover from failure and from sin. Do you? Do I? Do we allow and encourage and expect people to be able to recover? Jesus did. Look at how he works with Peter. Look at how he works with different folks who let him down. And number four, this one's powerful. In John 13, we see Jesus washing feet. Can you imagine the Son of God washing your feet? And then he turns around and says, go and do likewise. Go out and find service opportunities that are beneath you and gladly do them. That is life in the kingdom of God. Now, you think about it, discussion question maybe for right now. If you want to hit pause, uh, what are some other ways that you and other people in the room see Jesus living out this humility in his life? either in his teaching or the way that he lives his life. Take a moment, go around, and, and share that. So, in our society, is it not true that arrogance and swag are both taught and praised? From the schoolyard, to Hollywood, to the sports centers, to the White House, it's all around us. Kids are no longer taught how to lose with grace. It's win or die. It's win or nothing. If you're not a winner, you're useless, you're worthless. Think about this for, for a moment. These types of sayings. Second is for what? Losers, right? Second is for losers. If you're not cheating, you're not trying. Those are bumper stickers. Those are things we've seen. And yet we know by the word of God, those are lies. And we propagate those lies to the next generation by not teaching and modeling how to lose with grace and how to interact with those who are struggling. Let me tell you, humility opens doors and arrogance slams them shut. You want to be successful in business? You need to be humble. You need to be humble enough to talk to your employees, to talk to those on lower levels than you in this world's kingdoms. You need to think about the needs of others first. You might be arrogant. You might be arrogant if... Think about this list. Number one, you interrupt others a lot. While they're talking, you're thinking. You're not really listening. You're prepping to say what is what? Really important to you. So instead of me listening, I'm preparing to talk. Number two, do you find yourself totally just disregarding other people's opinions? Just quickly uh, dismissing or disregarding, not truly hearing them out, clarifying what they're saying, and making sure you understand them. Number three, how often do you seek ways to give credit to others? Most of us are real good about receiving credit, but how good are we at 
giving credit to others and purposely looking for others to give credit to. Number four, do you struggle with criticism? Someone speaks up and says, hey, you know, you, you shouldn't have done that, or I, I don't like the way you did that, and you take that and you go on the defensive and you give 14 reasons why you were right and everything they're saying is wrong. Number five, how good are you at celebrating the successes of others? How good are we at that? Do we enjoy that? Do we look for opportunities to take part in that? Recognize their wins and celebrate with them without any recognition for ourselves. Am I, am I comfortable working behind the scenes? If I'm going to lead, I need to know how to serve. Jesus was a servant leader. So let's do battle with arrogance. Read back through James chapter 4 this week and Luke 14. Listen to the word of God intently. Listen to others more carefully. Don't assume, and certainly don't assume you know more than everyone else. Lift up others every time you have a chance. Recognize their successes. Praise them. Get your hands dirty. Do the dirty work. Don't be afraid to kneel down and wash feet. Jesus did. So as you think about taking that on yourself, what does that look like? Be willing to do the menial task around you. Without being noticed, without being praised, quietly help someone. Clean up a mess, serve in any way that you can. Go out and be different and be a blessing. Have a great rest of your week.